Hello folks, it's the Pace of Chester again. Welcome to another one of my videos. In this one we're going to look at the proposals that were made in the 1980s to reintroduce trolleybuses to parts of South Yorkshire and West Yorkshire. We're going to look at some photographs and publicity and we'll look at what was proposed and why ultimately it didn't happen. Just a bit of an introduction first. Trolleybuses, for anybody who doesn't know, electrically powered buses that collect the power from an overhead wire in the same way as an electric tram or an electric train would do. The power is collected by two poles on the roof called booms. You can see them on this bus here, the uh, trial bus that South Yorkshire used in the 1980s. You can still find trolley buses in various parts of the world. In the UK, they were operated between 1911 and 1972. The first systems to open, uh, which did so on the same day, they had a joint opening ceremony with Leeds and Bradford, which opened on the 20th of June 1911. Leeds didn't really take to theirs, they closed their system in July 1928, whereas Bradford became the last system in the UK to be operational, closed on the 26th of March 1972. In the years in between, trolleybuses appeared and disappeared again in various towns and cities throughout the UK. Uh, too many to list, but you can find them in places such as Glasgow, London, Cardiff, Manchester, Bournemouth, Nottingham, Hull, uh, Newcastle, Various places like that, and also other places you wouldn't necessarily expect to find them, such as Ramsbottom in Lancashire. They had quite an early system. You wouldn't believe that Ramsbottom had any pioneering transport at any point, but it did. As I said, the last of the systems was Bradford, which closed in 1972. In the meantime, towards the end of the 1960s, passenger transport executives, or PTEs for short, had been formed in various of the larger conurbations in the UK, and in the early 1970s, some more were formed, it's two of the 1970s creations that we're looking at today, South Yorkshire PTE and West Yorkshire PTE, which were both formed in 1974. Also in the early 70s, there have been some trials with alternative propulsion of buses. Uh, there were some battery electric buses, mainly minibuses used on like town and centre, city centre shuttle services. They weren't really a success, the batteries were very heavy, so they couldn't carry as many people as normal, otherwise they would have overloaded the chassis. And also they couldn't complete a full day's duty, even on like a town centre shuttle service. They had to go off by about early afternoon and be recharged. There were also some trials with gas buses. Teesside Municipal Transport, for example, converted a double-decker to run on propane gas for a while, but that wasn't really successful. The reason behind these trials was uh, there was some concern about the quality of air in town and city centres. I know we think of air quality as a modern concern, but I'm doing this video in 2023. I'm talking about 50 odd years ago, it was a concern back then. Also in the 1970s there was concern over the supply of oil. Um, there were various problems in the Middle East that caused petrol rationing in the UK for some months between 1973 and 1974. There were also shortages in 1979. Um, and in the meantime there was concern over the rising price of oil. Again we think of these as really modern concerns but they're not. Uh, the price of oil went up sort of month after month in the 1970s. By the end of the 70s it was causing the transport industry quite a bit of concern and they decided to have a conference towards the end of 1980 to look at alternative propulsion which basically meant electrically powered vehicles. West Yorkshire PTE in a delightfully local government style scenario had a meeting to discuss uh, whether to attend the conference at which they decided they were going to attend the conference and they were also going to be at the forefront of developments. So yeah, they had a meeting about attending a conference. They followed this up with a proposal for a trolleybus route that was made in February of 1981. It was uh, to be put into Bradford, uh, between Bradford City Centre and the Buttershaw Estate, running along St Enoch's Road and uh, Little Horton Lane. Anybody who knows St Enoch's Road in Bradford will know it's a long uphill climb from the city centre towards Buttershaw, and it was thought of as an ideal proving ground for trolleybuses. Part of the logic of uh, picking the route was that the trolleybus support poles, the traction poles as they were called, that supported the overhead wires were still there, as they were indeed on, on many different roads in Bradford. The reason for that was when they'd fitted street lighting, they'd hung it from the traction poles. So when they got rid of trolleybuses, they took the wires off that the trolleybuses picked up the power from, but they had to leave the poles in place because they were in use as street lights. I'll show you quickly what I mean. This is a photograph I took in Eccles Hill in North Bradford in around 2013. You can see the streetlights here are actually ex-trolleybus traction poles all the way around this roundabout. 
They were in place in most places till around 2014, 2015, when they fitted low voltage lighting. Uh, and as part of that, they put new poles in, so they took the old trolleybus traction poles out. But at the time these proposals were being made in the 1980s, the trolleybus uh, traction poles were still there in most parts of Bradford. And they still met the current regulations. That really was more because nobody was using trolleybuses, so they hadn't updated the regulations. But either way, they still met the current regulations, so they could just hang the wires back off them again. So looks at doing a route in Bradford, as we said, from the city centre up to Buttershaw Estate. Um, they were going to use either trolley buses or duo buses, as we discussed earlier on. The PT decided they wanted a grant um, towards the cost, both of um, refixing the overhead wires and providing the power supply again. Uh, and also the cost of the vehicles. There was very much a by British mentality at that point, particularly in um, local government. Tales abound of council transport managers and PTE managers wanting to buy Volvos or Scanias for example and being told by the committees that oversaw them that no you can't you must buy British so they approached various British manufacturers um, to sound them out about building a trolley bus they all said that yes they would however it was thought it was going to be a very small market um, they were going to provide a few to West Yorkshire PTE nobody else seemed to be proposing at the time to do anything with trolley buses so it was unlikely to sell any more in Britain um, and the trolley buses generally had a longer life than diesel buses, so they could be expected to last 20 plus years in service. So obviously they wouldn't need replacements. So what they did, they tended to put the development costs onto the actual cost that the customer paid for the bus. And that put the cost of the bus up to quite astronomical proportions. So they wanted a grant. They approached both the British government and the European Economic Communities, it was then called the EEC, uh, the forerunner of today's EU. The EEC turned around more or less straight away. They'd already funded similar trial modern trolleybus routes in France and Italy. They didn't think they needed to fund three similar schemes. The British government took a bit longer. As we said, the proposal was first made in February 1981. The British government took until December 1981 to announce they weren't going to fund it. The reason they gave was a delightfully short-sighted response that the energy situation, i.e. The, the cost of oil, had stabilised. So they didn't think it was a priority. Of course, that ignores you know the possibility that the very next day the price of oil could have gone up again. But uh, that was the reason that they gave. In the meantime, at some point during 1981, the scheme had developed a northern extension. Um, it was going to run then from Eccles Hill through the centre of Bradford to Buttershaw. The target uh, opening date was going to be November 1983, and they were going to order 21 vehicles to run it. But as I said, they couldn't get funding. Um, in the meantime, while the government were prevaricating over the funding, in November 1981, a parliamentary act was applied for to enable the PTE to operate trolley buses, um, both for trials and in normal service, and also for them to erect overhead wires. South Yorkshire PTE later put in for a similar act. Um, in both cases, the government gave them powers to put trolley bus wires over any road in their respective counties. So basically that meant they could, if they wanted to, they could have put trolley bus wires on every single road in West Yorkshire and every single road in South Yorkshire. The government realised afterwards they'd been overly generous um, and they didn't repeat the mistake. The reason behind it was that if you were proposing a trolley bus route, say from A to B via Road 1, and they just gave the, the powers for that route, that's what you'd get. If you then wanted to extend it from B to C, you had to apply for another act. If you wanted to divert it down roads 2, 3 and 4, for a short distance part way along um, to give an alternative route, a second route, you need an, a parliamentary act for that as well. And the government didn't want to be bothered with these little parliamentary acts every time anybody wanted to extend a route or to vary one slightly. Um, so they gave them the overly generous powers to put them anywhere they wanted in their counties. As I said, they never made the mistake again, um, any future proposals, usually for trams, the parliamentary powers just um, gave them powers to erect the wires on that particular route that was being proposed. But yeah, despite the fact they hadn't got the funding authorised, they did get the Parliamentary Act authorised, so they, they were authorised to build um, trolley bus routes if they could ever get the funding for it. The uh, route had morphed as well, um, as well as the cross-city route from Eccles Hill to Buttershaw. It also developed a, an extension to Green Gates in the north of Bradford. So it's going to run from Green Gates and Eccles Hill through the city centre 
um, and then up to Buttershaw and Wibsey. And they were also going to then do a circular route in the Buttershaw estate. Obviously, they didn't get funding for any of this, so it never really progressed much further. Among the objectors to the scheme was British Rail, who said they didn't want any level crossings um, on their railways, which is bizarre, because anybody who's been to Bradford will know it's very hilly and there are no level crossings. There was only actually one in the city, and it was on um, a freight only line that didn't go that didn't um, cross the proposed trolleybus route anywhere anyway. Um, the one level crossing was on Hall Lane, which wasn't on any of the proposed trolleybus routes, so I'm not quite sure what they were saying there. British Rail at the time tended to object to any um, bus-based proposal, regardless of whether it actually affected them or not. So in December of 1981, some officials from West Yorkshire PT went off to France, Germany and Switzerland on a research trip. Um, I'm always a bit sceptical of those kind of things. I think a lot of the time they were just paid holidays, basically. Uh, shortly afterwards, the local county council, uh, Labour-run county council, refused to fund the trolleybus scheme from local money. So uh, they couldn't get any grants, even locally. They kept going in July 1982 and again in March 1983, they approached the government again to see if they could get funding. But uh, they were rejected both times. In the meantime, in uh, July 1983, uh, some trolleybus traction poles were recovered from the Huddersfield area from uh, Spain's Road in Birkby, so they had some spare ones um, for when the ones that were already in place you know, were missing or damaged, etc. They could have just replaced them very much on the cheap. And then late on in 1983, another approach was made to the government. Um, again, it was unsuccessful. So coming into 1984, they drew up a proposal to introduce trolleybuses to Leeds. They, they thought the government perhaps weren't interested in the Bradford scheme because it was in Bradford. There was very much a feeling at the time that most of the um, investment in the area was going into Leeds. Uh, without getting too political, there probably is still that feeling in West Yorkshire. I think that Leeds attracts most of the investment. So they thought it perhaps would interest the government more if they proposed for Leeds. Now, as we mentioned earlier on, Leeds had had a trolleybus system, but this was a completely different route. The original routes ran from um, City Square, or Thesk Road, just off City Square, down um, Whitehall Road to New Farnley and also between Geisley and Burley and Wharfdale, whereas the newly proposed routes in early 1984 were a figure of eight, with the centre of the eight being in the city centre around Vicar Lane. Uh, the north part of the city would have gone round Moortown and Roundey in a big circle, and in the south side of the city it would have done a circle around Middleton, so out via Dewsbury Road, and then uh, back in via Hunslet and Belle Isle. So it would have been an all-new uh, construction they still had the Bradford route in the proposals as a part two, um, hoping that the government would, as I say, because of the Leeds involvement, be more interested. The uh, cost of the buses for Bradford was supposed to be 2.1 million, for Leeds 5.9 million. And the buses in Bradford would have um, auxiliary diesel engines to be able to move around in the depot. Um, it was considered the depot didn't have enough headroom to clear the overhead wires, so they were going to fit the Bradford ones with an auxiliary engine so they can move around the depot um, and not have wires. So up until this point, the government had funded such schemes via a thing called the Transport Supplementary Grants, but they phased those out in 1984 to 85. They were going to be replaced by a, sec a thing called a Section 56 grant, but uh, that wasn't actually ready when they phased out the uh, Transport Supplementary Grant. There was a bit of a gap. So the PTE announced that it would have to wait until the 1986 and 7 financial year before the scheme could be progressed. In November 1985, there was a new proposal um, for a £9.6 million scheme to uh, introduce trolleybuses to Leeds as phase, um, phase one. And then phase two would have been the Bradford to Buttershaw route from the original proposal. Um, the extension up to Eccles Hill and Greengates had vanished again by this point. Uh, and phase three would be Leeds to Bradford, the interurban route, following the, basically the 72 bus route for anybody who knows the area, so from Leeds through Armley and Bramley Town End and Stanningley uh, and Thornbury into Bradford. So they applied to government for some funding for that. The government said they could they would only fund schemes that could pay their own way. Um, the PTE replied they thought theirs could. They also put into the EEC again for phases two and three. Uh, because they involved Bradford, Bradford qualified for EEC grant money because it was classed as a deprived area. Um, and so a scheme to improve the transport into Bradford would qualify for an EEC grant. Um, so they were just waiting to hear. 
So we've got a couple of maps photocopied from publicity uh, I've got in my collection. This is the uh, original scheme for the Bradford City, City Centre to Buttershaw route. As you can see it goes up to uh, Foster Square in the City Centre. There was an option to go up to, to the interchange, although they built a massive interchange, uh, a big, really big bus station, not all of the bus services in Bradford actually used it. And you can see there, Little Horton Lane, St Enoch's Road, and then around Buttershaw. This one is the Leeds proposal. If I uh, just go in, you can see more turn around the park there in the north. The city centre is the centre of the eight. And then the southern route there going down towards Middleton. This one has an extension to Cottingley as well, which wasn't mentioned in a lot of the text sources that I've got. You've got to remember the White Road Shopping Centre wasn't here at this time, so hence the main focus in South Leeds was Middleton and Cottingley, the housing estates there. And then this is a slightly later proposal for the Leeds to Bradford um, through route. You can see um, at some point they've also uh, proposed a route via Pudsey. And through the Rodley area as well. That wasn't on the original proposal. They, they talked about that because they thought it would increase the amount of people that it would take into Bradford. And it would probably um, get the EEC to give them a grant. There wasn't much talk about what buses they would use on it. This um, photograph that was uh, doctored appeared. This is actually a uh, Metrobus that was registered GUM501V. It's been uh, rather tongue-in-cheek um, re-registered on the photograph. It wasn't in real life. The photo has been doctored to um, OHM501X. OHM is OHM, i.e. the Unit of Electrical Resistance. Um, and as you can see, it's had trolleybus poles added to the photograph and wires as well. I think probably the more realistic um, variant of it was this from some of Metro's publicity, which is basically one of the standard row bodied little Olympians built as a trolley bus. Again, it's the, the standard bus just with a photo doctored to show a slightly sexier windscreen, um, a slightly more modern front end and the trolley bus booms on the roof there. In the meantime, in South Yorkshire, they proposed in the early 80s to uh, maintain a watching brief on world trolley bus developments. You can guarantee that meant they were going to watch what was happening in West Yorkshire very closely. They, um, after a couple of years, they proposed to reintroduce trolley buses to Doncaster and Rotherham. Um, initially, it was for four routes in Doncaster and two routes in Rotherham. The end game was that they were going to hopefully convert all of the main routes in Doncaster and Rotherham to trolley bus operation and just have diesel buses on the secondary routes. Uh, they also wanted a 50% government grant. They put in for a bill in November 1984 for powers to operate trolley buses um, and they got the bill granted as we discussed earlier on. They got powers to fit trolley bus wires over every single road in South Yorkshire. Um, also in 1984 they put together a consortium to design and build a trolley bus and a trial route to run it on. They thought they might get government grant better if they had something to show the government as in the trial route. So they got together with GEC of Manchester um, and various other people as well. And they built this vehicle. Now, there are two main versions of this. Um, one source says it was built as a trolley bus, but most sources say it wasn't. The, again, the cost of a new trolley bus that was being quoted was astronomical. They were putting development costs on. Um, so what appears to have happened... South Yorkshire PT had taken delivery of over 300 of these. This is a Dennis Dominator chassis um, built by Dennis of Guildford in Surrey. Um, the bodywork on most of them was like this. It was built by a firm called Alexander in Falkirk. They also had some that was done by East Lancashire in Blackburn and Northern Counties in Wigan, but most of them are the Alexander bodies. The last one that was supplied to the PTE vehicle 2450 um, was apparently supplied as a normal diesel bus. The normal... Um, procedure would be for the chassis to be sent straight up to the bodybuilder um, in most cases said Alexander in Falkirk and then the entire bus to be delivered to the PTE in the case of 2450 the bus that we've been looking at the chassis was apparently delivered to the PTE who then removed the engine and gearbox from it and it was sent off to GEC in Manchester where they fitted an electric motor uh, and the associated wiring they also put a 48 horsepower auxiliary diesel engine into it so it could move off the wires. 
and then it was sent up the modified chassis was sent up to Alexander at Falkirk if I compare the two buses this shot of 2450 by the way um, I share the copyright on this with bus slide of Blackpool uh, whereas this shot is one of mine that I took in Doncaster South bus station in 1997 now they look very very similar but in actual fact the body on 2450 was different um, the booms and the mountains put a lot of stress onto the body structure so they had to reinforce it with steel the only visible difference really was it didn't have a lower deck back window you can see just through the windows there it's it's blank at the back um, it did have some trolley retrievers on you can see some ropes coming down from the uh, booms just there and they went through these things called retrievers so if the booms came off the wires the retrievers locked and stopped them from flying up and causing chaos and then you could pull them back down using the rope and put them back on the wire they also had indicators on the back, um, as well as the normal indicators you would find on a vehicle. They had some special ones to try and indicate to following drivers which of the wires it, the trolley bus was going to take at a junction. Um, obviously, if they'd gone into proper service, they would have had to do a publicity campaign educating local drivers and also probably change the highway code. So they built a test route for this trolley bus to run on and um, they approached Doncaster Council who owned the race course and the little road that runs next to it called Sandalbeat Road. The uh, council agreed they could erect overhead wires along Sandalbeat Road. They went across from that road, uh, straight across the dual carriageway that the depot was situated on, into the depot yard and then they went up to the end of the depot yard, turned through 180 degrees and came back out again. They didn't actually needed the powers that they got in the parliamentary bill to do a few yards of wiring um, in the depot yard obviously the PTE themselves owned the depot so they didn't need permission from anybody apart from themselves to erect the wires um, and on Sandalbeat Road they needed the permission of the landowner which was Doncaster Council so they actually used the parliamentary powers where they crossed the dual carriageway ledge away outside the garage the auxiliary diesel engine that was fitted was used to move the bus in and out of the depot buildings um, the depot buildings themselves weren't wired it was felt safer to not have overhead wires in the building. So if it needed to go inside, it just um, dropped the booms down and then the engine was switched on. It drove in on the diesel engine. You can see part of the depot in the uh, background of this photograph. Um, this futuristic looking building looks a bit like a football stadium. is actually part of the Doncaster garage. It's uh, still there now. So 2450 was uh, delivered from Alexander's of Falkirk in September of 1985 in an old cream livery. They hadn't decided what livery to paint it in yet. As uh, seen here, this is on the trial route. This is another um, photo that I own the copyright of jointly with bus slide. And again, there's another photograph of it on the trial route there. Just to give you a sense of period, you've got what appears to be a Maurice Ital estate there. After much wrangling, it appeared in this uh, rather nice livery with red at the back and the uh, standard PTE brown skirt at the front. And it uh, entered the trial service on the demonstration line. It did carry passengers at least once. There was an open day at the depot um, and it carried passengers along the demonstration route um, on that occasion. But it settled down to its testing. It was quite reliable. They were quite happy with it. It could do up to 40 miles an hour, which was plenty fast enough for the routes it was going to work on. But then uh, when the trial had finished, um, that was it. It was parked up. Eventually it was sent on loan to the Trolleybus Museum at Sandtoft. Um, and after a few years, it actually passed into the ownership of the museum and it's still there. I believe at the moment, uh, 2023, it's not operational. It's having some rewiring done, but it's still there to view at the Sandtoft Trolleybus Museum. So why didn't the scheme progress, we ask? Well, uh, we'll find out in a bit because the reasons it didn't progress are the same reasons that the West Yorkshire ones didn't, which we'll come back to. So going back to West Yorkshire, in February 1986, the government said that they weren't going to fund any more bus schemes um, until bus deregulation had happened, which was due for October 1986. Um, in a nutshell, before deregulation, if you wanted to introduce a bus service, you had to um, register it with your local traffic commissioners. They would then publish your ap um, application to run the bus service in a publication called Notices and Proceedings. Anybody who wanted to object to you running the bus service could object uh, which they always did, all the existing bus operators in the area and British Rail would object. Because objections had been raised, they had to then have a hearing, uh, at which 99% of the applications would just be thrown out. Um, so it was very difficult to register a bus service. After deregulation, all you had to do was give the traffic commissioners 
42 days notice, in other words, six weeks, that you wanted to run a service, and then you could just run it. Um, unless anybody objecting could prove it was against the public interest, which they couldn't really, because it's very hard to prove whether a service that isn't running yet is, is for or against the public interest. So yeah, after the regulation, you could just introduce any bus route you wanted to. So the government wanted to see how that affected the bus industry and how it all shook down before they started investing in new bus-based schemes. The PTEs also went through changes. Um, the county councils that had overseen them were abolished around the same time. So they became um, overseen by bodies called PTAs, Public Transport Authorities. Just for ease of convenience, we're going to refer to them still as PTEs in this video so we don't fall over ourselves. Um, they also weren't allowed to operate buses directly anymore. South Yorkshire had operated most of the buses in Sheffield, Rotherham and Doncaster themselves. And West Yorkshire had operated most of the ones in Leeds, Bradford, Halifax, Huddersfield and Calderdale themselves. From deregulation, they had to set up what were known as arm's length companies that uh, were run like private companies, but the PTE still owned all the shares. Uh, South Yorkshire's was called South Yorkshire Transport, but traded as South Yorkshire's Transport. And West Yorkshire's was known as Yorkshire Rider. So as the regulation was approaching, South Yorkshire had just mothballed their proposals and they were too busy setting up South Yorkshire Transport to worry about anything else. Uh, West Yorkshire in the meantime reshuffled their proposal in May 1986 um, to try and get the EEC funding brought forward. So the Bradford City Centre to Buttershaw part of the scheme would now be phase one. The Bradford to Leeds bit would be phase two and this was at the point where they started to propose going via Pudsey and Rodley rather than just following the main road route. Um, and then the Leeds bit would be phase three. In uh, October 1986, the PTA, the new uh, governing body, agreed to apply to the EEC for a £5 million grant towards the total cost of the scheme. The target was for the Buttershaw to Bradford bit to start in 1987 or 88 and the full scheme to be built by 1991. However, in March 1987, there was a proposal made for Leeds uh, Super Tram to introduce modern trams to Leeds, and that was given priority in the uh, planning um, in September 1987. They decided that was going to be the priority scheme. But um, shortly after, well, in September 1987, the trolleybus scheme was relaunched. Sorry, in May 1987, the tram was given the priority. Uh, in September, the trolleybus scheme was relaunched. Um, although the EEC was still thinking about whether to fund it or not, um, the decision on funding hadn't been announced. The uh, the PTE decided to go ahead, um, press ahead and invite tenders um, to build the route and also to build a fleet of buses to run on it. As I've already said, a lot of the proposals for the fleet uh, involved buses such as this, um, modified into trolley buses. The bodies on these were originally built by Row at Crossgates in Leeds. The, the factory closed there in 1984. A year later it was reopened by its former management team as Optair. But initially they built very similar bodies. This is a very late row built one. But the early Optairs were more or less identical. So most of the proposals up to press had been for this kind of vehicle. They did express the uh, hope that the vehicles would be built in Britain. But the by British kind of thinking had gone by the wayside at this point. Um, increasingly vehicles were being imported from abroad largely because they were just better products to be honest and then towards the end of 1987 um, early 88 the EEC announced that they weren't going to fund the scheme after all however in October 1988 um, at the Conservative Party conference there was a surprise announcement by the Transport Secretary Paul Challen um, who gave the go-ahead for phase one of the scheme the Bradford to Buttershaw part um, they said they would um, give them the funding to do uh, phase one which was a complete bolt out of the blue. They weren't expecting um, anything like that to occur. By that point, there was some thinking that the buses used on the scheme needed to be a bit uh, more eye-catching. Uh, this is an Optair Delta, the um, a body built by Optair in Leeds on uh, DAF running units. Um, again, the, it's been doctored to look like a trolley bus, but this was the kind of thing that was proposed. As you can see, it's far more eye-catching than the double-decker bus that I showed you earlier on. Also in October 1988, when the uh, surprise funding announcement was being made at the Conservative Party conference, the PTE uh, proposed adding a city centre feeder service, um, so they would have done a loop of Bradford city centre to get more um, of the shopping area involved in the trolleybus route. Uh, that would have increased the cost a little bit more as well. 
So in December 1988, tenders were invited um, for the buses um, and the overhead installation. One of the bidders was a Hungarian company called Gantz, um, which kind of showed you that the thing about building the buses in Britain was a hope rather than an actual expectation. The first spanner in the works came from Yorkshire Rider, um, which as I said had been West Yorkshire's arm's length bus operating company. It was privatised, it was sold to its management and employees in 1988. They announced shortly after the tender process started that if they didn't get the tender to run the trolleybus routes, they would run buses in competition with it and undermine the uh, economic case. As we said, um, the government would only fund schemes that could pay the way. So Yorkshire Rider said, basically, if you don't give us the contract to run them, we'll just run diesel buses on the same route. We'll take away some of the passengers and it won't be able to pay its way. So basically, we will scupper it. That should have been a warning shot to the PTE to stop what they were doing. But instead, they uh, announced that they were going to give the contract to run the service to Yorkshire Rider. Um, so the scheme won, basically. So in 1989, there were a couple of announcements. First of all... Um, they announced in May 1989 they expected to open the route in June 1991, the, Brad the Bradford to Buttershaw route. It was also announced um, about the same time that the cost of vehicles had actually gone up. They'd underestimated the cost. Um, the electric equipment in particular was going to cost far more than they thought it would. And they estimated that eight vehicles for the initial part of the route would now cost around £2.4 million. Pounds. Uh, South Yorkshire's test track was still in place at this point. The uh, overhead wires weren't removed until 1993. Um, so West Yorkshire approached South Yorkshire and asked if they could use their test track to um, test trolleybuses and to train the drivers on how to drive them, uh, which they said they could. It never actually happened, but they got permission for it to uh, take place. So various manufacturers at this point were offering trolleybuses. Um, they asked for tenders. They sat down with Yorkshire Rider and um, decided they needed something that looked a little bit more attractive than a normal bus, as we've already discussed. The only uh, manufacturer to give them any kind of a firm tender was Dennis Specialist Vehicles of Guildford, who built 2450, and they came in at a whopping £285,000 per vehicle, um, which was a lot of money um, for what they were going to be. So it still looked promising, it still looked like the scheme was going to go ahead, and then in 1992 things happened in quick succession that uh, killed the scheme stone dead. Um, the advantage of trolleybuses that were given to the government to try and get funding was that they were quieter, um, their acceleration was better so they could get to the end of the route quicker and they needed fewer buses to run the service. Uh, obviously they were lower emission, they only had like tyre and brake emissions rather than exhaust emissions unless they had an auxiliary diesel engine that they used, but generally they wouldn't be um, emitting fumes. And they could also climb the hills better, particularly important on um, St Enoch's Road, as we discussed, a long uphill climb. However, in April 1990, Yorkshire Rider took delivery of uh, some of these, um, at 42 Scania N113 double-deckers. Most of them are Alexander bodies, similar to 2450, that we've been looking at for most of this video. Um, a few of them had Northern Counties bodies, such as this one. This is the former, this is um, 8010 or 8010. Now, the reason these caused a bit of a, a problem with the trolleybus scheme was that they were really, really quick. Um, they were really quiet. Scania had been working since the 1970s on trying to reduce the noise of its vehicles. Way back in about 1973, they'd um, put into service a bus marketed as the Hush bus that had soundproofing around its engine compartment. And they've been working ever since, so they were a lot quieter than normal diesel buses, even though they were diesel buses. Uh, they could also accelerate really, really quickly. Um, their acceleration was better at more or less every point of the speed range than the projections for the trolley buses. Um, they could climb hills as if they weren't there. They were quite happy, equally happy going uphill as they were downhill. They were uh, really wear machines. And also for the day, they were low emission. They were the latest emission standards of the time. But basically, they were a lot cheaper than trolley buses. They came in at less than £100,000 a bus, uh, as opposed to 285000 for the trolley bus. So people began to question, why don't we just buy some of these? We've got all the advantages of a trolley bus, but at half the cost, or less than half the cost. It's perhaps telling to realise that none of those buses ever actually entered service in Bradford. They all went to Leeds. Um, when Bradford did get new buses, it got Leyland Olympians, which had similar bodies to the one we've just seen by Northern Counties, but not the same chassis. 
And I think there was a bit of embarrassment uh, on the part of Yorkshire Rider that meant that the Scanniers never actually came to Bradford. They worked in from Leeds on routes between the two places, but they never actually were allocated to Bradford itself. So although they were wavering, they carried on. They uh, spoke to Mercedes about um, doing a version of their 0405 articulated bus. So they were going to get basically a bendy bus, but an articulated trolley bus, which would have the wow facts that they needed. Um, they'd also need fewer buses because they could carry more people than uh, a conventional single-decker or even a double-decker. Admittedly, a lot of them were standing, but they could still carry more people. So they thought they needed fewer buses, and that would cut the cost down a little bit. Although the cost of the vehicles would be higher um, per vehicle, they need fewer of them. So that would enable them to do it for a similar amount of money. So some people from the PTU and Yorkshire Rider went out to Mannheim to meet with Mercedes. It seemed to be going quite well. So on the 13th of July 1990, the proposals, as they stood at the time, were presented to a trolleybus working party um, at a meeting. They also spoke about the meetings with Mercedes in Mannheim. Um, also on that day, 13th of July 1990, the hammer blow that saw the end of the proposal um, happened as well. And the hammer blow came from these boys. This is Pride of the Road, um, which was set up in Royston near Barnsley in the 1980s. Um, they also operated at various times in Huddersfield, in Leeds, um, in Bradford and in Hull. Now on the 13th of July 1990 they um, announced they were going to start running a service between Bradford City Centre and the Buttershaw Estate that paralleled the route proposed to be used by the trolley bus. And that killed the scheme off because the PTE and Yorkshire Rider belatedly realised that if that happened, if anybody registered the bus service, which they couldn't prevent them from doing, it would undermine the economic case. The trolleybuses wouldn't pay the way and it just undermined it completely. The service, um, as proposed, I think it ran every half hour. It wasn't particularly frequent. It didn't last very long either. It only lasted a few months when it actually did start. But it was just enough, abstracting those few passengers every half hour um, was enough to scupper the trolleybus economic case. And that was the problem. You couldn't stop anybody from registering in competition with your trolleybuses um, and undermining your economics. South Yorkshire had realised this back in 1985 that the new Act, deregulation, the new Transport Act of the time meant that anybody could run over the routes and you couldn't guarantee to have a monopoly. So you couldn't guarantee that your scheme would pay its way. And that's why they didn't progress theirs. Unfortunately, it took West Yorkshire PTE um, a number of years longer to make the same realisation. It was only when this registration from Pride of the Road landed on the desk that they suddenly realised that no, they couldn't do it. Um, ironically, nowadays, in the early 20, 21st century, legislation was brought in, so if you had electrically powered vehicles with fixed infrastructure, such as trams or trolleybuses, you could actually protect them from competing routes, so you could stop other bus companies from uh, registering new services along the route of the tram or the trolleybus. Um, ones that were already running at the time the tram or trolleybus were introduced could remain there, so hence, if you go on Manchester Metrolink, there are buses running alongside the trams. But you can register a new service that runs parallel to the tramway. Um, it's only tramways. Nobody's proposed to do trolleybuses since, apart from um, a proposal in Leeds a few years ago, which never really came to anything. Uh, new Generation Transport, it was called. But the only things that have actually used the powers have been tramways, um, particularly in Manchester, the extension to the Metrolink. But yeah... That kind of legislation didn't exist in the late 1980s, in the 90s. It was against everything the Conservatives wanted to achieve in their Transport Act, where they wanted competition, you know, and free market competition and things to take place. Um, so at that time, you couldn't guarantee the trolleybuses a monopoly, and that is why the scheme ultimately failed. And it took uh, a small operator with some very, very second-hand Leyland Nationals. This one started life with Ribble in the northwest of England, it's actually in Hull, this one. It's not in Bradford, but it's the same operator and probably the vehicle would have run in Bradford at some point. But yeah, it took them to uh, galvanise the PTE uh, into realising that the scheme wasn't a goer. So hopefully, uh, before much longer, I'm going to visit the site of the test line in Doncaster that South Yorkshire PTE built. There isn't, as far as I know, anything left of it, but you can still walk along the route along Sandalbeat Road. So I'll do that. That'll be like a part two of this um, feature. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. As always, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please feel free to like and subscribe if you want to for more of my uh, somewhat mixed transport content. 
But yeah, thank you for watching. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.